preaching at the weakest moment of his life, Jesus had already said to Peter, I pray for you that you don't give up, that you don't give in, and that you don't give out. For the time that is ours to share, I want to speak from the topic, a sobering perspective. First Peter 5 and 1 through 3. Three things I'm going, to, I'm going to give you today that I want you to really take time to study for yourself and to think about. The first thing I believe that that in order to understand and look at life from a sobering perspective, you're going to need invigorated, delegated leadership. If the leadership ain't excited, the people ain't going to be excited. I'm saying this to you in this form and fashion because that's what Peter did. When you look at first Peter five, he was speaking to the leadership. Then he say he in the same time he turned and spoke to the flock. We'll get to that in a few minutes. You need invigor. You need to invigorate delegated leadership. I need these two men who have accepted the challenge of being elders to understand in front of y'all the requirements that this actually has on our lives. In 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, it says this, to the elders, Peter's saying, to the elders which are among you, I exhort, whom also am an elder. I am also an elder and a witness of the suffering Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He tells the elders as he exhorts them, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither being as lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. The word invigorate means this, to give vigor, fill with life and energize. Peter puts emphasis on his exhortation to them. He tells them that not only have they been exalted, but he's also in the same position. Peter is telling these elders that I'm not going to require anything of you that I myself will not take or already am doing. I'm not going to put you in a lower position than me. If you were at the baptism, I believe Dr. J. Charles Oggs said it magnificently that the elders don't come in to be subservient to me as the lead pastor, but they come in alongside. I've got to trust them with my life. I got to trust them with my family. I got to trust them with everything. Because I come in with this understanding. This church does not belong to me. This flock, you do not belong to me. I come in this door with this understanding that my desire and my passion is to teach you of the chief shepherd who loves you better than I ever could. I hope I'm taking my time today. Peter describes the duties that he performs and expects these leaders to uphold. The pastoral duty is threefold. You need to understand this because a lot of folk just go into church and they got folk telling them what to do. And, you know, now you cleaning toilets when, uh, you know, and then that's supposed to be, you know, you'll humble yourself before the mm hmm. Mm -mm. No. That, that's not it. You, you, you need to, you know, the pastor needs to be the one that can go in there and clean the toilet. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The, the pastor is a servant. The pastor is the one who doesn't sleep, who makes sure that the flock is where they're supposed to be. Now, is that possible that one man can do all of this? No. That's why God tells us to go out and make disciples to grow people in the word so that they mature in the faith. And as you see maturity in the faith through built relationships, you help them to become leaders. The pastoral duty is threefold. Number one, feed the flock. 
by preaching to them the sincere word of God and ruling them according to such directions and discipline as the word of God prescribes, both which are implied in this expression, feed the flock. You should not come to church and walk out of here not understanding what was said. You should walk out of here and with an understanding that what I just got knowledge of, I should be able to go and describe to somebody else. If your only motive is to come to church, get a good shout on, this is not the place for you. If this message today is too boring for you because you're actually learning something, this is not the place for you. But I want you to go out of here and to be able to say, I know what a pastor does. Preachers of L.A. should not tell you what preachers do because that is not truth. The elders are to do. Now, I'm going to laugh. He ain't in here, so I'm going to talk. Oh, dog, he came back. Brother Lamar since last week has been telling everybody to call him Bishop, Dr. Reverend, <laughs> Pastor, uh, Every, all them titles and he just rolling them all in and you know he won't address you unless you call him one of them titles <laughs> he won't he won't address you at all but understand this the, the second part of the pastoral requirement and this is going to mess all of us up because it messed me up the elders are exhorted to do the office of bishops a bishop is not a person with churches under him. I can own a church's chicken and be called a bishop because <laughs> it's churches, if that's the case. The, the office of bishop is more administrative. Mm -hmm. It's more making sure the day-to-day -day operations of the church are in order. It's not some highfalutin kiss my purple ring position that we've created. Let me help you understand something and don't take my word for it, but go study it for yourself. This bishop that we see, especially in the black community, is the Catholic version. Go look at the guard. Go look at all of this. The bishop, a bishop is... Uh, episcopos, an overseer, a guardian, is ordained or consecrated member of the Christian clergy who is generally entrusted with a position of authority and oversight. There are things as a lead pastor that I'm not going to be able to do in the future. So I have to trust Lamar. I have to trust Brother Kemp that they have, we have bonded enough that when they open their mouths, they sound like the direction that God gave me. That the church won't split because the elders have a different perspective. That means we got to still meet. We got to still communicate. When I see uh, uh, something that, that, that doesn't agree with where we are, we can't be friends enough that I can't say that ain't, that ain't cool. Mm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. Mm. This is not a dictatorship. This is oversight. I'm in a position not to be your dictator, but to oversee, to make sure that at the end of the day, my job is to make sure you understand the word of God. At the end of the day, Lamar has already been moving into the position of making sure that the day to day things are in place. That means in the very near future, he's going to come to some of you and say, I need help with some things. Brother Kemp is going to come to some of you as as the deacons and and the deaconess are put into place in a position of training. He's going to come to you and say, I need help with some things because church has gotten it off. Some of the things originally prescribed in the word have been altered to fit the leadership and make sure that the leadership is elevated. I like visuals. 
And at the end of the day, leadership should never be elevated. We're to honor one another, but we should not be exalted. God, I hope I'm preaching to somebody. Not only must we learn to feed the flock, to be exhorted to administrate and oversee as guardians of that flock, but also be examples to that flock. Practice holiness, self-denial, mortification, and all other Christian duties which they preach and recommend to people. This, this in, in a lot of cases, is not taught. Or talked about. If, if I can, uh, since it's uh, public knowledge, I'm not going to I'm not going to put his name out there, but he kind of put himself out there. Preachers in L.A., uh, uh, Noel Jones, I can't call him Bishop. Uh, Noel Jones looks like a gigolo. I don't want to settle down. She's my friend. 16 years. And what? Are you going to marry her? Because marriage is honorable. Marriage is what we should all push for. It's not easy. I, when, when, I, when I talk to people and counsel people, I tell them, listen, you're you going you gonna to have, where, where, where Jermaine and Cherry at? Where, where uh, Eddie and Nicole? You're going to have ups and downs. You're going to like each other one day and two weeks you won't. But you in it for the long haul. You in it because you made that decision to. These duties, help me Lord, must be performed not by constraint, not because you must do them, not because of compulsion or civil power or the constraint or fear of being shamed, but from a willing mind that takes pleasure in the work, not for High pay, not for filthy lucre, not for a Ferrari if I get so many members, not for a bigger house, but because this is my passion, I do whatever I needed to do to continue to do what God told me to do. Neither as being lords over God's heritage tyrannizing over them by compulsion or coercive force or imposing unscriptural and human inventions upon them instead of necessary duties. Sounds like the church, ladies and gentlemen. Sounds like if people would open up Matthew 20 and 25 and 26 or 2 Corinthians 1 and 24, they would leave some of these churches. Sounds like if people would just open their Bibles and say, I feel manipulated. I don't think that's scriptural. And the scary part is, it ain't. I'm, I'm trying to stay focused. Leadership, these elders must lead with this understanding. That Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. He bought them. He rules them. He defends them. He alone saves them forever. He is also the chief shepherd over all inferior shepherds. I don't care how many pats I get on my back, how many good messages I have, and even the bad ones that I get good credit for. God is still chief shepherd. Jesus Christ. We got to preach with this understanding that Jesus Christ will appear to judge all ministers and under shepherds. I'm, I'm scared to call a title. I'm, I'm really afraid to. You know, I know in a black church, you know, you got to call folk past and I get that conversation all the time. I'm real scared. Not because I'm doing nothing wrong. I'm just real scared because we, we put too much emphasis on this title. I know folk got titles, and first of all, the title don't belong to half of you. Because you, for $75, you can buy a bishop title. You know that. 
You can buy a piece of paper with and now you're the bishop of something. And you ain't got no churches under you or nothing. Or you ain't ministrating in nothing. You don't nobody even like you, but you a bishop. You go and go get a little purple amethyst ring and it's not even a real bishop ring. You get it out the bubblegum machine and put it on your finger and call you. I'm serious. That's how that's how we've done. And we've we've elevated and exalted people who have exalted themselves. Jesus Christ will appear to judge all ministers and under shepherds to call them to account whether they have faithfully discharged their duties, both publicly and privately. My Lord. Those that are found to have done their duties shall have what is infinitely better than temporal gain. They shall receive from the grand shepherd a high degree of everlasting glory, a crown of glory that does not fade away. I don't need a big house on earth. I'm cool where I am. I don't need a better car on earth. I'm great where I am. I don't need a huge bank account. The money that God supplies, supplies all my needs. And when it runs out, he puts some more in the bank. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I don't need that extra stuff. It would be nice, but I would abuse it. Oh, I say, I said, I mean, you said it, you said it, you said it, you said it. I heard you say it. When, when, when the lottery go high, you don't play the lottery, but Lord, help me hit the lottery by mistake on purpose, Jesus. I promise to buy all of your people something, Jesus. I just want to leave a package at their door, Jesus, that their life be forever changed, Jesus. And if you hit, we wouldn't see you no more, Jesus. When witnessing a sobering perspective, you must first invigorate delegated leadership. Brother Kemp and I were talking at the door and he was telling Vicky this morning. He going to tell his wife something. And I'm appreciative of that. That's a great example for me as a young married pastor. He was telling his wife that sometimes I, I, when I when I wait, when he said, when I weighed the heaviness of what I accepted, it's a lot. I ain't I ain't got bald spots and losing this little patch right here in the front for no reason. You know, it's great to just stand here for for 38 to 45 minutes on Sunday. That's good. But uh, it's it's always Monday through Saturday night that causes stuff to leave and turn gray. <laughs> You got to invigorate delegated leadership. Secondly, you must view this 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 sobering perspective from the trickle down theory. It says, likewise, in verse five, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humil humility for God resists the proud. And it gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud for the proud have found a way to fulfill and acknowledge themselves. But it's always that person that I don't know how you got here. I don't know why I should thank you, but thank you. Having settled and explained the duties of pastors and spiritual leaders in the church. The apostle now comes to instruct the flock. He's, he's in a position where he's spoken with the leadership. Now he's speaking to the flock. And, and I want to say this is a Latin proverb that I found. It says, by learning, you will teach. By teaching, you will learn. C can I say that that's so true? Because even, even being here, Having to study the word, knowing that you want more than three hots and a cot with a hoop out the door, it causes me to desire learning so that I can properly teach. So that you leave out with, with an invigorated position of life, understanding the power of God in your life, not just the leader's. 
although many remain faithful to traditional church, uh, I've noticed in the last few years, some have decided to stay home. I noticed that some have seen too much in the background. So they did, they'd rather just find somebody who may be across country that I don't have to connect to, but they teach a good word when, when I'm not uh, preaching or, or, or studying to, to, to prepare for you. There are teachers that I listen to, but they are not here. I like John MacArthur. I listen to Francis Chan. If you see me do a lot of this, he does a lot of that. I pick that up. You know, he, he, he talks with emphasis. And I try not to do that. But when you, when you learn, when, you, when, when it's something that you're, he's passionate about, this, this relationship with God. I, wa I want to learn from people who are passionate. And sometimes we go through these offshore methods because I don't really want to get close to people. I, I told him sometimes when things happen, you become guarded. And you, 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 I show my face, but I don't, I ain't really there. Okay, I just want to make sure. One of the things that I've noticed, and I think we've all noticed and we nod when we talk about it, is that the church community has lowered its standard and allowed leadership to lead under a lowered standard. The church community sees what's going on in the pulpit, behind closed doors, yet you continue to show up, continue to write checks, and finance foolishness. That, that's, that's real tough to think about and real tough to say, and I'm not coming down on us because we're here trying to make sure that at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that, that I, can I be real honest? Can I be real honest? One of the things that motivates me to make sure that I'm in place is this man right here. Brother Rod said to me uh, when I when we were getting ready to start, I sent an email and, you know, everybody was responding. Rod responded. He's like, man, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it, man. But right now, I'm just not, you know, we've seen a lot and we had a conversation. And and he said, you know, I just, you know, I just I can't do it, man. I seen leadership do X, Y, Z. You know, I just can't put myself in that position. And that conversation between he and I, a lot of days is my motivation to say, man, I just want Rod to come back. I want to make sure that I'm doing, I know that sounds real selfish. And I'm not, I, I feel that way about everybody, but he and I had this conversation. I don't want to do anything that's going to cause him to walk away from God. Amen. 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 I don't want to do anything. And if, it's just, if, I, if I feel that way about him, I don't even know you that well. I want you to come in and have this relationship with God. I want to make sure that when you walk out, you know you got that relationship with God. When the standard is lowered, the repercussions are more serious. It's called the trickle down theory. The trickle down theory is a marketing phenomenon that affects consumer goods, but it also can be looked at in a social status. Uh, the, the marketing phenomenon says that I'm going to put this product on the market and really only the affluent people will be able to afford it. And then after a while, we're going to make money off the affluent people by overpricing the product because they can afford it and they want to have something that don't nobody else have. So when we lower the price and put it in the community, it's going to spread and we're going to double, triple, quadruple what we made initially. The same thing is happening in the church. We're putting in leadership. This 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 autonomous uh, uh, behavior where people think that I'm getting something that I really can't afford to walk in the anointing that God I really can't afford because we put a financial uh, a weight on things. We put a prestige on things. But the truth of the matter is I'm no different from you. God just called me to preach and I accept it. I said, I'll, I'll walk away from whatever you want me to walk away from so that I can be obedient to what you call me to do. And if I said that, I came from Second Avenue. Half of y'all don't know where that is, you know, but statistically, ain't, we ain't supposed to be doing this. We supposed to be a cool, you know, we supposed to be in another mindset. 
too much has been put on a, 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 a financial perspective, especially when it comes to church, when it all boils down to leadership and, and development of people. It's not about finances. It's never been about finances. God didn't tell us to grow churches and build buildings. He told us to build people, make disciples, feed my flock, oversee people, be examples to people. That's all he said. But what if, what if leaders really begin to, uh, to uphold the standard of the, of the word of God? What if leaders took the standard of the word of God at face value and didn't alter them to make themselves comfortable to still be in leadership and still have their sins. If leaders upheld the word of God at face value, then guess what? People will uphold the word of God at face value. I'm going to get into some in a few minutes. Uh, the trickle down theory, theory states that people who submit themselves under men who practice holy living, this, this, they, they begin to practice holy living for themselves. I'm not just standing up here telling you to live holy. Then I'm gambling and screwing and doing all this other stuff. I'm telling you to live holy because I've discovered that it is the best way to live. That you're not living unless you're living holy. That you got to fight every temptation, every desire, every want, every need. And you got to balance those things against the word of God for your life. Asking him, God, is this what you want? Is this your will? Is this going to draw me closer to you or further away from you? And then respond to his answer by the way you live. This trickle down theory should not be done as a contest to see who is the most humble. This should not be done to prove who works the hardest without recognition. This should be done so that God is pleased with our love for him and our servanthood for one another. Not only must you invigorate delegated leadership and deal with the trickle down effect, but lastly, there has to be, when it comes to a sobering perspective, there has to be a collective agreement. Verse six through eight. I'm the most excited about this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. Somebody in the room may be asking, Doug, why are you taking time for us to get an understanding of the work of elders? I thought, you know, just preachers, they just preach or they study and they, you know, they hoop one and grab the ear of them, throw their leg. No, no, no. You need to understand the people who God has put in front of you because one day it may, sir, be your turn. There are too many personal agendas in the body of Christ. And not enough people living up to what the word simply requires. I intend to bring further clarity to it, the importance of Christ being the focus of leadership in the church. I don't want to stand before you because I've done this and I had something that I wanted to do a certain way. And if it wasn't done a certain way, then I, as the leader, can throw a temper tantrum and send everybody into a frenzy because you didn't do it the way I wanted it done. But my name ain't God. Come on. <laughs> hmm. Upon researching the appointment of Levitical priesthood, I found something so interesting. Psalms 133 says this, and it talks about that original priesthood with Aaron, 
and his son. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the, the, the anointing is like the, the, the oil that flows down the beard, even Aaron's beard that anointed not only Aaron, but it went down to his sons. They, a visual of that whole anointing is that Aaron would be there with his sons and the anointing oil that was poured on him as a Levitical priest would literally go down his face. They would literally drench him in oil. And as he's drenched in oil, there's so much anointing oil that is placed on him that it literally went down to his sons. It asserted that the priesthood changed. It asserted that there must be, if the priesthood changed, there was also a change or an adjustment in the law. That, that went past you, so I'm going to stop and bring it into understanding. When I, how can I say this without getting in trouble? I'll deal with somebody else. Uh, as, a, as pastors, when, when in, in the traditional church, when a church votes on the pastor, mm -hmm. they bring in the pastor, that pastor in about three months is going to change everything because he's going to change it to fit his leadership style. That's, that's a model that we brought in and, and, and was brought in and, and we recognize it here in the word of God. That was under the Levitical priesthood that the leader made adjustments to the law, understanding this, that the law was given to man by God and in and of itself, it was already perfect. You just had to live according to it. 633 laws, you keep up with them, you live them, but everybody couldn't do it. So a leader would come in and he probably couldn't deal with uh, number 22 and number 69 and number 42. So we're going to make changes to these laws because I as a leader recognize that that is virtually impossible. Right? And, and, and so as Levitical priesthood, there were changes every time a new leader came into place, there was another change to the law. If the original law was perfect in and of itself and those 633 original laws that were given were given by God and they were in a place where man had to keep up with them and it, would, it still wouldn't have made them all the way holy because nobody is perfect. All of us have sinned, but it would have kept us in line. But if we start making changes, if we start saying in church, now we're going to acknowledge uh, uh, we're going to acknowledge same-sex marriages in church. We just adjusted our standard of the law when God already said, that ain't cool. I I'm going to say for the record, this church will never perform same-sex marriages. They just, they just put something in, in Illinois where it's mandatory. That they can, if a church has a, check this out, if the church has a 501c3, they can make you perform. Go get your government money if you want to. And if you don't, they'll try to sue you. Hope you got good lawyers. Because it's going to be put in the bylaws, uh, elders, that the church does not perform weddings. That's on the leadership. I'll make that decision if I want to perform a wedding and I won't put this church in a position that the church has to defend itself. Help me, God. It is asserted that the priesthood changed the laws. There must, as, as the priesthood changed, there must be a change of the law. The dispensation could not be the same of the, under another priesthood. A new priesthood must uh, 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 a new priesthood must be under a new regulation managed in another way and by rules proper to its nature and order. But because of the new covenant of our high priest, Jesus Christ, Christ became the remediation for all sin. Therefore, there was no need to change the law. We couldn't live up to it. We never could. Even when it was uh, for lack of a better term, dumb down the Ten Commandments. 
Some of y'all got pens from your office. <laughs> You'll catch that tomorrow. Wait for it. Wait for it. We should now, I believe, adjust new leadership to the new covenant by a collective agreement. If you have your Bibles ready, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 and 22 through 25 says this. By so much, Jesus was made surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were, they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continues forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he lives forever to make intercession for them. The Levitical priesthood in a nutshell perfected nothing. The methods that we are bringing in the church don't really perfect anything. There are very few churches who still uphold the standard of the word of God. There's so many churches now trying to be politically correct. Mm -hmm. Amen. There's so many churches trying to appease the people. Mm -hmm. When the Bible tells the leaders to feed the flock, that means the leader has to prepare something that is nurturing to the flock, which allows it to grow and not tell the let the flock tell them what they want to eat. Now, I'm not saying that so I can be manipulative. I'm not saying that so the leaders can come in here and tell you this, this, and this. Because they, they, they're not supposed to be leading. We're not supposed to be leading for filthy lucre. We're not supposed to be leading because we're trying to get something from you. We're supposed to be leading to get the word of God in you. Knowing that once the word of God is in you, you're strong enough to stand against the wiles and the tricks of the enemy. But the sad part is the enemy has been standing in church pulpits for the last 20 plus years. And we're having trick or treat, trunk or treat. And we, we doing all the stuff opposite the world. And it's really no different. The Levitical priesthood perfected nothing. It could not justify men's, a man's from personal guilt. It could not sanctify them from inward pollution. It could not cleanse them from the consciousness of, uh, the, uh, of dead works. But the priesthood of Christ carried with it a hope. I'd like to have hope. I'm a hopeful person. My wife will tell you, if I get if I get bent out to do something, I'm I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna look at it with the greatest hope, because at the end of the day, even if it don't work, I try. Even if I fall flat on my face, I at least didn't sit there wringing my thumbs, wishing. My my word tells me that have hope, cause hope. Won't make you ashamed. And even if it falls flat on his face, at least I did something and didn't, I just wasn't idle. Hope by which we in, are encouraged to enter into a covenant union with him. Not hope that he gives us money. Not hope that he buys us something big that we can show off. But that in a personal covenant relationship, we spend eternity because we decided here. The former priesthood rather kept men at a distance and under spiritual bondage. My question is, how do we operate under this new covenant priesthood with Christ? The word of God tells us three things. That we got to do. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That he may exalt you in due time. And that exaltation is not about being lifted up. 
in front of people to become famous. It's not about being exalted so that uh, so that you can go somewhere and people know your name. I, I, I have the I've had the pleasure for the last two weeks, I believe, week and a half. Uh, I, I'm sitting at my office and uh, as I'm sitting at my office, this lady comes in and, you know, when she comes in, everybody's like. I don't know who she is. First of all, I don't get to see TV no more and I don't know who she is. And so all of everybody come in. I saw her leave out one day last week and then somebody stopped and just picked up a piece of paper and asked her, could she sign it? Who is this? This is uh, uh, Diane from Real Housewives of Atlanta. Yeah, somebody say, oh, you listen to it. Uh, <laughs> Diane is Nene Leake's friend. And she's sitting in there. I don't know what she's doing on the show, but she, she is in a position that her life has become known. And she's in a place where she, if, even if she didn't want to be recognized, she's going to be recognized. And people are looking for that. People have now come to church looking for that. What else, where all these titles come from? Go ahead, tell me. I'll wait. Because we're looking for that. But one of the things that my, my, my partner and I, Claude, asked her, how is it being somewhere and everybody always, she said, I can't stand it. I can't go eat with my kids. My kids ask me, Mom, can we just cook at home? Because there's no private life. But the church is clamoring for this. We're asking for this. And I'm going to say this to you. You're going to get what you asked for. But you ain't going to like it. I like getting up in the morning. I like going where I want to go. Doing what I say I'm going to do. And I like going home. I used to live a life as a leader. I used to live a life where I wanted fame. Man, I wanted to be somebody. And I realized, man, I'm already somebody. If don't nobody know my name, God know my name. If don't nobody know how to spell my name, as long as it's spelled in the Lamb's Book of Life the right way, that's all that matters to me. So my Bible says, <clears throat> humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. There was a time as a pastor, as a leader, as a person in the community, I was somewhere all the time. I don't go nowhere and I don't want to go nowhere. I want to go home. I want to get in my bed. I want to look at my wife, my daughter. I want to, I want to play Monopoly. My wife beat this week. We don't like her right now, but we're going to love her the next week. We're going to work her out when we try a new game. But if I wasn't there, I wouldn't get that. And I can't get that time back. And we spend so much time trying to be something to everybody else and we're nothing to the people that matter. Lord, I thank you. I give you praise. I give you honor. I simply magnify you for talking to us today, for giving us your word, teaching us to humble ourselves in your presence, that if we cast our cares on you, you care for us. And I thank you for making us sober and aware of the tricks, the schemes of the enemies, and sometimes our own schemes, sometimes our own manipulation. Thank you for giving us leadership who will lead according to your word. Thank you for giving us people who will follow leaders who lead according to your word, who also grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are, who will one day themselves become the leaders you've called them to be. I honor you today. Thank you for giving us a sobering perspective. It's in Jesus' name I pray.